Well, we're here uh, literally uh, three days after the momentous vote on uh, the Asylum and Migration Pact, which was on Wednesday night, finally uh, went through at 70, 79 to 72, which is very, very tight. And uh, so this is, this is more, more like a whodunit look back um, on, on, on the events that unfolded. But what is extraordinary about today, which is Saturday, Saturday morning after the vote, is that there hasn't been one single columnist cover what has been an absolutely momentous decision by, by the Oireachtas uh, during the week. And uh, I just find that quite extraordinary. And the same again this weekend, not a single columnist in any of the, the broadsheets uh, have, have covered, covered it at all. In fact, uh, the last few days have been filled with many other stories, none of them as significant or anywhere could be regarded as being remotely near the relevance of what happened uh, to us all uh, on, on Wednesday night. And with me to discuss uh, what, what has occurred uh, and, and get into some of the detail on, on who voted, why they might have voted and uh, what, what are the next steps. I'm delighted uh, to interview uh, Tracy O'Mani, Barrister Tracy O'Mani. Uh, so Tracy, you know, you've been, uh, you've been in the wars really uh, around all of this kind of stuff uh, since the very early stages in quarter one, 2020. I know that because uh, we've met a few times. And, um, uh, and you've been unerringly accurate in, in many of your uh, legal analysis, uh, which you've done m many, m many times on, um, on, on, uh, on, on vid video casts. So um, I'm very interested uh, to hear your take on, uh, firstly, on the next legal, just if we could start maybe, Tracy, with the legal side. So this decision has now been made by the Oireachtas, but then it has to be notified to the president of the EU Parliament, I think. And that, that's a process that's going to take a bit of time. Is there, is, is there anything at all, legally, is there any instrument at all? Because there's a lot of confusion out there, and I want to kind of clear that up. Uh, that can be done at this mm -hmm. stage. Um, so first of all, I think we're aware that there has been potentially two legal actions that have been taken by um, separate plaintiffs. Um, Michelle Keane and Una McGurk. Um, so they both took injunctions to try and stop the government from, number one, I believe, holding the vote, and number two, from opting into the EU Migration Pact, as you say, whereby they have to notify the European Parliament or the European Council that they intend to opt in. Um, as I understand it, Michelle Keane's legal case uh, has been unsuccessful, but as I understand it, Una McGurk's case is still ongoing. So there is still a potential that UNA may be able to secure an injunction that would stop the government from opting in. Um, the first point that I would note is... and Even though the vote has gone through? Even though the vote has mm. gone through. Well, to be honest with you, in my opinion, I didn't think that it was ever going to be possible to stop the vote happening because obviously in this country, under the Constitution, we had the separation of powers, which is meant to be a checks and balances between the different organs of the state that each can't interfere in the other. So what that would mean is that the judiciary couldn't interfere with the role of the Oireachtas or the legislator or the executive uh, in relation to uh, policy matters or in relation to the likes of the vote, the EU Migration Pact vote. So I didn't think it was ever going to be possible to stop that vote taking place because that's a decision of the Oireachtas to hold that vote. Um, so I would always have thought that if somebody was seeking an injunction, it would have to be after the vote had taken place, but before we actually opted into the pact. Mm. Because once we opt into the pact, there's a potential that um, under the Constitution as part of the Lisbon referendum, this um, clause that we agreed to, the necessitated obligations clause, would be triggered, which says that EU law is supreme over Irish law in certain limited circumstances. Um, so my fear would be that once the government formally opt in to the EU Migration Pact, it may not be possible after that to stop it from, from happening. But, that, but, but the formality of that requires the government now to notify yes. the EU that we're, we're going to opt in. But is there, is a whole, what, what's the time gap between now and then? Do you have any idea? Um, the only, the only information I have on that is just a comment that Helen McEntee where she said that it would take a, a couple of weeks. Okay. But at the same time, I'm not sure how much credence we, could sh we should give to that statement mm. because at one point we thought the vote was happening today, then we thought it was happening tomorrow, then we thought it was happening at 11 o'clock at night mm. and then it ends up happening at half eight. So I think an awful lot of the time they might say certain things and we will hang on those statements mm. uh, and then something else happens that actually you know, makes something that we're trying to do redundant. Um, so she has commented that it would take a couple of weeks but um, there's no firm commitment that that's actually correct. 
Well, uh, on, uh, on, 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 on Tuesday night, I, I did a series of interviews, but one in particular with Matty McGrath, and I asked Matty about the, 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 the manoeuvrings that were going on around all of this business, and it's a very, very interesting discussion. That's, a, that's, a, that's up separately on, on YouTube, uh, and you, you, can, you can have a look at that. And we, we get into how the state is actually organised after 10 minutes in that discussion, what I call the deep state. Uh, they're my words. And, uh, you know, and, and it, it's a fascinating uh, insight from the trenches in the dog and his response to the questions that I gave to him. So now we're going to go and we're going to have a look at the actual vote, the moment of the vote in the Dáil uh, on, on Wednesday night, quite late. Neil 73, there were no abstentions. The motion is agreed. Yes, yes. This motion has such serious consequences for Irish people, and the gap is only six votes. I'm asking for a vote other than electronic means. Well, since the, since the gap is less than 10, and as a vote has been demanded by a teller, we proceed with a vote. But we'll, please, we'll proceed with a vote, a roll call vote. So, Tracy, uh, uh, obviously, uh, it's very, very unsatisfactory, uh, the manoeuvring around, you know, the getting it through, trying to guillotine it. Uh, you know, as soon as the election was over, it was suddenly back on the agenda. It was pulled before the election. Uh, and then the, the whip system came in and there was a very tight, uh, a tight yes vote uh, by only a margin of seven. So um, let's have a look at, the, at, the, uh, at those that voted for this, uh, for this pact. Sure. So, as you said, there were 79 votes in favour and 72 votes against. So there was a margin, as you said, of seven. 151 TDs showed up to vote and 99 TDs weren't present. So in terms of the yes votes, what happened was every um, Green Party TD showed up and voted yes. Every Fianna Fáil TD bar two showed up and voted yes. And every Fianna Gael TD bar two showed up and voted yes. So this very much was a government um, manoeuvred vote uh, and that's what actually propelled it through. So just in relation to the no votes, um, so as we said there were uh, 72 people who voted no, so that was um, the different parties that voted no, number one was AIN2, obviously Pather Tobin is the only TD that we have in AIN2. We had 18 independent TDs, so my understanding is that every independent TD voted against it. But can I pause you there? Isn't that very sure. significant that all independent yes. TDs voted no because they were plugged into what the people felt on the ground? Absolutely. Whereas the political parties were following the whip system Absolutely. and basically taking their orders from above. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And even if you see a number of the, the different laws that the, the government has been passing over the last number of years that have been somewhat controversial, even for some of those laws, a good number of the independent TDs or so-called independent TDs did vote with the government. So I do think it is very significant that no independent TD voted in favour of this pact. Definitely, very significant. I, I'm going to ask I, what might be a silly question, but um, uh, and I probably know the answer to it. But a lot of people might think this: Why wasn't there a free vote given for such an extraordinary decision to be made by 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 the nation? Uh, when you say a free vote, do you mean no why, whips? Why, no whips. Well, because the government had told the EU that they were going to ensure that this pact was passed, and it's as simple as that, it was going to pass. So they were never going to give a free vote to TDs on it, ever. Mm. And uh, w there was also some missing people, uh, un most unusually missing, sure. um, the, the, the leader of Sinn Féin, mm -hmm. absent. Well, so as I said, um, AIN2 voted no, um, 18 independent TDs voted no, Sinn Féin, um, they have 37 TDs in the doll. 36 attended and voted no. Mary Lou was nowhere to be seen, which I would say for the leader of a party, if you're against such a significant transfer of sovereignty for a party that's meant to be Republican in nature, for the leader of that party not to turn up is significant, I would say. Mm. Uh, and I think an awful lot of people haven't actually been pointing out the fact that Mary Lou Macdonald did not attend that vote, so that is significant. Then in relation to the Social Democrats, I think the Social Democrats have um, six TDs, so 
uh, five showed up and voted no, and the only one who didn't was Jennifer Whitmore. And then in relation to Labour, I believe Labour have seven TDs, five showed up and two didn't, uh, Aidan O'Reardon, who has been appointed an MEP but who hasn't taken up his seat yet, so he was entitled to vote, and the other one was Duncan Smith. And then I believe the only other person who didn't turn up was Joan Collins, who's a, a, a TD with Independence for Change. So all in all, even if we had the, the TDs, so there was obviously four TDs from Fianna Gael and Fianna Fáil who could have voted with the party, and then there were five other TDs who potentially could have voted no. Um, so obviously if we add those five number TDs to the 72 who did vote no, we would still only have been at 77, mm. and the government were at 79. So unless some people within the government either voted against the government or didn't turn up, it still wouldn't have gone our way. So mm. it was the government who propelled this through at the end of the day. But what, what, what I find, um, and I know it's how, it's how our system operates, uh, I, I don't call it democracy operating mm -hmm. properly, um, but nevertheless it is, it is what, how it's done at the moment. Um, but I find it quite extraordinary that all 18 independent TDs, clearly listening to the, to the, to the grassroots, voted no, along, along with some other, other, other smaller parties, I get that. Um, and, but to me that's very, very significant. And that that all of the um, Fine Gael, Fianna Fáil and Green TDs went along with the whip, which means that they were, they, 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 they were clearly not listening or decided not to act in the interests of their own constituents because it was an overwhelming feeling out there that we were all picking up, mm -hmm. including the independents, so it was real, to say, no, we, we don't want to opt into this because we have voted about this previously in, in, in Lisbon and, we, um, uh, and we, we retained the right and, and people were aware that the, that the Danes weren't doing so either. So I just found it a very, very sad night um, to, to, to see all this play out. Uh, I think it's going to have ramifications in the up and coming general election. What do you think? I hope it has ramifications. Mm. Uh, I think an awful lot of people say that the local election isn't a reflection on how people will vote in the general election. Um, and I certainly hope that is the case. I hope that the electorate look at what the government did here and they realise that the people that they are electing in their local constituencies to represent them are not representing them. I really hope they recognise that and when the general election comes up and a lot of us are hearing that it's going to be in October of this year um, that they actually vote to make sure they vote these people out and vote in people who do have the interests of the Irish people at the forefront. Mm. Now I just wanted to, just, just on that particular point, um, I just wanted to talk, touch briefly on the 1922 Constitution, Article 48, mm -hmm. which, which, which allowed the people to uh, take part in, in, uh, in, in people's referendums. To initiate. To initiate. Mm -hmm. and, and therefore it was the closest to what I would describe as the Swiss model at the moment. And, and that was then repealed. Sorry, it just didn't appear in the 1937 version of the Constitution. Well, I'm not sure if you actually understand, and uh, no. not, obviously not being no. condescending yeah. or anything, I'm not sure if you understand how it happened. So the 1922 Constitution under Article 48 said that the government um, should legislate within, I think it was two or three years of that Constitution coming into effect, they should legislate for direct democracy whereby the people could initiate a referendum. And if they didn't legislate for it, the default was that if 75% of the electorate um, petitioned the government that they would have to hold a referendum on a particular issue. So that was 1922 and that constitution was obviously passed, that was the constitution of the Irish Free State. By 1924 the government were saying, hang on a second, this idea of direct democracy, not sure that we really like this idea. And by 1924 uh, a subcommittee was suggesting that the law should be repealed, mm. that it actually should be deleted out of the constitution. And by 1928, it actually was deleted out of the Constitution. So what the government had done when they introduced the 1922 Constitution was they had another article in it that said that if there were latent defects in the Constitution, they had a period of eight years to rectify those defects. And most people thought those defects were like drafting errors. But what the government said to themselves was, this clause is so widely worded that we can actually change anything we want in the Constitution. So they actually legislated in 1928 to remove the direct democracy... Um, control of the people. Control, yeah, mm. control of the people, mm. to take it out of the Constitution. So that happened in 1928. Okay. And to add insult to injury, in 1930 they actually said to themselves, OK, we like this ability to be able to amend the Constitution without having to go to the people. So what we're going to actually do is, by virtue of that clause where we can, where we can amend the Constitution, we're going to increase this window where we can amend it for eight years for another eight years. 
So they actually increased the ability to amend the constitution without going to the people for a period of 16 years. And then we obviously know in 1937, the, um, the 1937 constitution was brought in and there was nothing in the 1937 constitution about direct democracy. And also the 1937 constitution introduced the concept of the common good. So I think there was an awful lot of review of the constitution and what works well and what doesn't work well and by the time they got to the 1937 constitution they had it very well ironed out to make sure that they had and they, these aren't my words these are the words of some tds in 1937 when they were actually debating the constitution they said that there was a dictatorial level of authority um, given to the government through the constitution and another thing is as well i suppose is in addition to introducing the common good, which we know obviously means that the rights of the collective supersede the rights of the individual, and it was on the basis of the common good that they introduced an awful lot of laws, say around COVID, even around things like the, the property charges, things like that, that have gone through the courts to determine whether or not they are constitutional. And the courts have said, because of the common good, they are constitutional, because you know we can take money off this person to give it to this person for the common good. But there are also an awful lot of other limitations and restrictions in the Constitution. So even if you're talking about the likes of hate speech or protest exclusion zones, an awful lot of the fundamental rights in the Constitution, they're subject to public order and morality. So they're subject, there's an awful lot of subjects to the common good, they're subject to public order and morality. So an awful lot of the rights in the Constitution, they're not absolute, yeah. where people think they are. So I think an awful lot of people look at the Constitution and they say, well, I have this blue book, and this blue book gives me rights and freedoms. The first thing that I would say is that no politician writing down on a piece of paper gives anybody rights and freedoms. People have natural rights by virtue of being alive. Um, the Constitution may protect some rights, and that's one thing I think that we want to hammer home to people. Um, but second of all, the Constitution, in my view, is an illusion of freedom because there is so much restriction in the Constitution. Um, so I think they, they very much got it right when they were looking at 1922 and, and you know, 1928, 1930, 1937. They were saying, what works well here and what doesn't work well here? And how do we maintain control? And by the time they got to the 1937 constitution, they had figured it out. Mm. But, <clears throat> but if a provision like that existed, and say, say it wasn't taken, mm. it wasn't diluted and then just forgotten about, in a situation like that, I mean, the, the bank bailout, the, uh, you know, the, 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 the implementation of uh, vaccine passports, all of that might, might, might have never even, even been tabled if the people had, the, uh, had the, the capacity to bypass the National Chamber and say, no, we actually want a national vote about this. Absolutely. And that's the reason they couldn't allow it to remain in there, because they don't want the people to have that power. They want them to have the illusion of freedom while the government retains the power. So, so if that, if, so therefore, the, 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 we're beginning to see momentum behind uh, political parties, smaller political parties forming because of these, this gap in the, t t you know, to the right of the centre, let's, let's just call it mm -hmm. that. And, um, you know, that's going to come up uh, in, the, in the general election. There's, is, isn't there a possibility there that if they, if they get it, right, if, if that were to become a, a common policy position, uh, we, we, we actually want to empower the Irish people again. We want to go back in principle to what happened in 1922 and implement it because we never again want to see the National Chamber manoeuvred in the way that it was manoeuvred this week. And it wouldn't be the first time, but in this particular case, it was about handing over control of the borders to the banal bureaucrats in Brussels. Mm -hmm. Definitely, I think if that was a policy posi uh, position, and I do know obviously the, the party Direct Democracy Ireland, that yeah. was obviously their main policy mm. position, as I understand it, was to bring back direct democracy to the people. Mm. Um, I think there are potentially, uh, well, obviously there are no political parties at the moment that are advocating for that type well, of... Well, they certainly wouldn't. It would be Absolutely. like the Turkey's voting for Christmas, exactly. wouldn't it? Um, especially for those, the, the incumbent, you know, Fine Gael, Fianna Fáil, and of course the Greens, the, the rump of the Greens, mm -hmm. uh, to form, form a coalition, are certainly not going to agree to something like that. Because, as you said, they're not actually representing the people. Mm. They're, they're doing, I think, an awful lot of our laws now, obviously, are created, drafted, implemented, signed off in Europe. Uh, sometimes I wonder what we're actually paying our politicians for. Mm. And I believe between their salary, their allowances and their expenses, they're on maybe about 170,000 a year. Mm. So once we increase the doll seats from 160 to 174 in the next general election, the TDs are costing us just for that alone, not even including their pensions and whatever other um, your committees they might be on, they're costing us about 30 million a year. And if they're actually outsourcing their legislative function to the EU, 
what are we paying them for? Mm. It's a very good question. But, but I was just, just to focus on the, um, on, on the differentiator. So, so if, the, if the National Chamber wants to hold on to all these, you know, what I call pretty arcane maneuvers about how the doll operates and, and would see a threat, a significant threat to their power and privilege and position, if the people themselves can organize their own, mm -hmm. their, 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 their own votes on key issues, like for example, the Immigration and Migration Pact, uh, and, and other things like the bank bailout and all of these major decisions that are simply made through the party whip system. Um, that would be a big differentiator, wouldn't it, between the fledgling parties coming through and the existing political parties because they, they would be completely alienated from one another on, mm -hmm. on, a, on a crystal clear point. It definitely would, but I think one of the issues that you would have is the type of parties that would be willing to propose that type of an initiative are probably the type of parties that couldn't actually get access to the mainstream media. Mm. So the, the public at large wouldn't even know that this was one of their policy positions because the media, who I believe at this point are nearly controlled by the government, um, the media wouldn't let that information get out into the public because they want to maintain, obviously, control with the government parties as it stands at the minute. Mm. So that is the fact that we don't have an independent, well-financed media is a significant issue in trying to break through to the, the, the middle, middle Ireland. Mm. But there is a bigger issue there, of course, and that that the leadership... The, lead, the medical leadership, uh, the, the, the press leadership, the government leadership are the same leadership that pulled us through the three years of, of, of COVID and all of the stuff that went on there. So I, I really don't see them um, softening, softening their position because they're, they're protecting themselves, especially now from the significant level of data that's coming, coming in globally about the impact mm -hmm. of all of this on, on public health everywhere. Yeah, absolutely. So how do you see that playing out then? You know, I know it's a political question, but I'd be curious to, to see, see what you think. How do you see that playing out uh, in the up-and-coming general election? I mean, the, the, the carryover from the refusal of the people to go with the commentariat and the political establishment in the constitutional referendum, which was very, very significant, uh, and then the, 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 the big growth, the, the big swing towards no, not voting for any particular party in the, the independent swing in the, in the locals. How do you see that moving forward? Because you, you were just saying there quite correctly that the, that the media are very much pro the establishment position and clearly they're not, they're not covering mm -hmm. the momentous events this week today in the national newspapers and, and I don't expect they'll be covered tomorrow in the Sunday newspapers, which is absolutely extraordinary when you, when you yes. think, think, think it through. So how do, you, how do you think it might play out then at the general election? Um, I think I think an awful lot of people say, and, and I would agree, that the local election isn't an indicator of how the general election will go. An awful lot of people, and I know from hearing people on the ground, an awful lot of people were saying, well, you know, I voted for this guy because he came to my father's funeral, or I voted for this guy because he got traffic lights down the end of the road. So it's very much, you know, local community. So it's not necessarily an indicator of how things are going to go in the general election. Um, I also think that the 8th of March referendums um, on the family and the home. I, I don't necessarily know that those referendums were a win for you know, the centre-right. I think there were an awful lot of people came out that Middle Ireland would consider to be respectable and then that made it okay for them to hold the same opinion as those people. Whereas an awful lot of people when they're talking about the likes of say the immigration issue they'll kind of whisper it. Mm. You know, they still kind of think there's something wrong with saying that you know, we should have a cap on the number of people that we bring into this country because we only have a, a finite number of resources or, or limit, limited resources in the country um, and that those resources should primarily be devoted to the people of this country, the people who pay the taxes, the people who have actually built this country mm. up over years. Um, so I think there is still a cohort of people that will kind of whisper that. So they still don't feel like, even though they might go and have it, you know, in an independent poll or a, a confidential poll, they might say, this is my view on immigration, but they're still not going to go down, you know, and talk quite openly about it. Um, but you would hope that once they go to the ballot box, they will vote in accordance with uh, their view on it. Um, I think one of the problems that we do have is that the, the people who are, say, the, the, the centre-right, those parties, they don't get, as I said, an awful lot of media coverage. So an awful lot of people don't even know who these people are. Like I know I've, taught, I've spoken to a good lot of people who before the local elections I was saying to them how are you voting and they were saying well I'm not happy voting for the government because I don't agree with them on this and this and this and I said well who are you voting in the alternative and they said well I don't know that I have anybody to vote for 
And then I mentioned a couple of, you know, the parties that I might consider that I would have voted for. And they said, I've never heard of them. Mm -hmm. And the reason they've never heard of them is because they can't get onto the mainstream media. Mm -hmm. So even if the people who would, who would maybe agree with some of our views, even if those people um, wanted to vote for parties, I don't think a lot of the time they even know who to vote for. Mm. And as well as that, I think there's a somewhat of a fracture um, between the number of parties that are out there. And an awful lot of people are calling for some level of unity between the parties so there isn't a split in the vote and that there aren't too many people running. But I certainly think that if it was possible to get some kind of a level of cooperation between those parties, there is a potential that we could get people elected. And I think that's something that those groups, I would hope personally, would be focused on for the next general election. Mm, I'm sure it will. But can I just, just, there's been a lot of confusion. I know it seems like the week went on forever. I mean, just, it was only a few days ago that this happened. And, um, and, and, and just three days ago, I was in, I, I was in my underground studio in, um, in Boswell's Hotel across the road from the action. So uh, trying, trying to, you know, in, in interviewing very, in, a very interesting group of people. All that's up online. But... I just wanted to just ask you about um, the confusion. Some people seem to think that there is a role here for the for the president of Ireland, uh, you know, to refer for all this to the to the Supreme Court, but there's not, sure there's not. No, there isn't. So I believe that's Article 26 of the Constitution, which refers to the ability of the president in certain limited circumstances to refer bills to the Supreme Court to test their constitutionality. But what people aren't recognising is that this is not a bill. This was a motion with a vote. It's not a bill. It's not a piece of legislation. So it hasn't gone through, even though it has gone through the Dáil and the Shannon, it's not a piece of law. So it's just a motion with a vote. And his ability to refer bills to the Supreme Court is limited to bills, proposed pieces of law. So I don't believe there's an avenue there for the president to actually do that. So if we take that answer and we go back to the the legal action that's still underway, we, we believe in the High Court, which is the Una McGurk um, uh, case. And we know that there may be, may be a couple of weeks between now and the notification to the EU. Once it goes into the EU, it becomes part of EU law and it's outside of the jurisdiction. Or potentially. Potentially, yeah. potentially. Um, let's say that that happens and it goes and it, it gets, a, you know, the, the process continues and it's uninterrupted. Where does that leave us then in terms of, 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 of what, what, what kind of difficulty are we then in? Um, well, firstly, in relation to Una's case or anybody else that will be taking a case uh, after the vote has happened and before we formally opt in, um, pretend, uh, presumably that would be an injunction to stop them opting in. And I would presume the argument that people would be making, because I'm not involved in any of the legal cases that, that anybody is taking, I presume the argument they would be making is that on the basis of the 1987 uh, Crotty versus Antishuk mm. case, that what the government are doing is an, an unauthorised delegation of uh, authority, um, whereby they're transferring the sovereignty of the Irish people over to Brussels. Um, my difficulty with that argument is, and I hope I'm wrong, and I'm not a constitutional law expert, um, but my understanding would be that that potentially isn't unconstitutional because we have held no less than three referendums whereby the Irish people have agreed to cede authority to the government in the areas of freedom, security and justice, which includes immigration and asylum. Uh, first, by virtue of the Treaty of Amsterdam in 1997-98. Mm. Second of all, by virtue of the Treaty of Nice in 2002-2003. Mm. And third of all, by virtue of the Treaty of Lisbon, Lisbon. in 2008-2009. So my concern is that we have already ceded authority to the government to... Um, opt in or not to these laws and the problem is when you're going into the court what you're saying to the court is that it's an unauthorized delegation of authority i think we've already given that authority to the government so that's the first issue but the one thing that i would like to say is that even if una mcgurk's case or anybody anybody else who might take a case even if it's unsuccessful at this point there is still another avenue open to us and that is, so under the EU Migration Pact, there are five regulations. Mm. There's the Eurodact regulation, the Screening Regulation, the Asylum Procedure Regulation, the uh, Migration Management Regulation, and the Crisis Enforcement Euro Regulation. So there are five regulations just within the pact. And just to say, just within those five regulations, there's 719 pages of legal text within those five regulations. And as I understand it, the Dáil maybe had less than 15 hours to debate mm. that. So that's in itself just outrageous. But in addition to those five regulations, there are other, maybe another five directives that are also being uh, introduced as part of that EU migration pact. So there are 10 pieces of law 
So they all have to come back through the doll then, do they? No, mm. no, but what Helen McEntee did say is that, um, what Helen McEntee did say is that they're going to have to repeal the International Protection Act and introduce alternative laws in order to bring forward the mechanisms set out within the EU Migration Pact. So whatever laws they bring forward will have to go through the normal legislative process. So it'll have to go through the five stages in the Shannon, the five stages in the Dáil, then be signed off by the President. So what that means, and first of all, Helen McEntee said, mm. that's possibly not even going to start until November of this year. And obviously, if we have a general election before that, the makeup of the doll could be significantly different mm. depending on how people vote. So there's a possibility that those laws would not be passed in the doll. There's a possibility they would not be passed in the Shannon. And there's also a possibility they would not be signed off by the president. That's very, very interesting. I just want just, 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 just to take a, a breath on that for a second. So that I'm summarizing it mm -hmm. and correct me if I, if I get it wrong. Uh, Therefore, the, so w e even if it is notified to the EU Parliament successfully and, it isn't, and it, there's not enough dirt in the engine and the action underway in the, in the, in the High Court, th th it then comes back through the actual doll again, but this time in, in the form of legislation that would have to go through these phases and the President would sign it, to actually put the, e to put the engine, the legal engine together to support it. So let's say we didn't say we didn't. We, we just we just we, we just didn't do that. Where would that then leave us with, with regards to the EU? We're saying we're opting into something, but by the way, we've we've we're now kind of not opting into it because we we're we're not putting the legislative engine behind it. Mm -hmm. So there are two ways that laws can be passed within the European Union. There are regulations and there are directives. So the EU Migration Pact has been passed by means of uh, five number regulations. Regulations are normally directly effective. So that means that you don't normally have to introduce domestic laws in order to enact the, uh, the mechanism set out within the regulations. These regulations seem to be different. Um, these regulations are saying that you do have to enact laws. But what the regulation itself says is that each individual member state has two years to introduce their own laws to introduce the mechanisms uh, under the EU Migration Pact into their national systems. So if we did nothing, uh, what it would potentially mean is that after two years, the EU would be writing to us and they would be saying, you're now in breach of the EU Migration Pact, you've signed up to it. And they'd probably start fining us like they've done with the likes of Hungary and that. Mm. But it all comes down to the appetite then of the government to just say, Fair enough, the fines are there, we'll accept the fines or we won't pay the fines. But it all comes down to who the government is at the time. But doesn't it also come down, and this is very, very, this is fascinating. Um, I'm sure people listening will, will find it as well. So, so if, but, but when we then, if we then swing away from Ireland for a second and we look what happened in Europe after the EU uh, the elections, we clearly see, in France especially, a huge swing towards uh, Le Pen's party, the, the national rally, and we've already seen it in Italy, and another huge swing going on in Germany, from the centre to the right, with people that think along the lines that we might think along. And, and that's going to change the dynamics itself. And you know something? That's why the vote in the European Parliament was so significant. I believe the vote happened on the 10th of April of this year. I believe they had to ensure that the vote in the European Parliament to pass the EU Migration Pact happened before the European elections took place because they knew everybody could see things were moving a little bit further right because things had gone so insane left. Mm. So they may not even have gotten that pact across the line if the pact vote had been held after the European elections. But the senior politicians now that are t coming to the fore, like um, 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 I think his name is Bardello, the uh, Jordan Bardello, the, this young man that's going to be the president of the uh, potentially the president, uh, in, you know, in, in a few days' time, you know, because the election, I think the the, ele the election process in France is going to be over around the third or fourth of July, uh, th so uh, w we could be back again talking about all of this because. Um, I mean, the, the mathematics, are, the, 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 the calculus of power is going to change within the EU itself because these are politicians that have very, very strong views on, uh, on, on, the, on these undocumented um, immigrants coming into countries, you know, without paperwork mm -hmm. uh, and claiming to be refugees when, you know, a lot of them seem to be economic migrants. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, um, that gentleman that you were just talking about there, what country is he representing? Fr France. France. Mm. So if you're talking about the likes of France or the likes of Italy, so obviously all of the countries now have signed up to the EU Migration Pact with potentially the exception maybe of Denmark and obviously we need to formally opt in. But we also know that there are certain countries that are, are more significantly affected by migration. 
Um, so you might have the likes of maybe Italy, Greece, France, mm. Germany. And the problem with the EU Migration Pact is that under one of the regulations, the Asylum Migration Management Regulation, it introduces what they refer to as solidarity mechanisms. So what that says is that every EU member state that signed up to the pact would have to say, accept relocation of a certain quota of asylum seekers or pay a financial penalty. So my concern would be that the likes of those people um, who don't necessarily want undocumented male migrants coming into their country might say, well, under the EU migration pact, I can offload some of those migrants into other countries or I can take money through this solidarity fund which is €20,000 per person in lieu of accepting relocation of a certain number of asylum seekers. So even though we might look at them and we might say well they're not going to be in favour of this, they might actually say that at the end of the day signing up to it benefits their country because it's going to be sharing the responsibility out between other member states. So I'm not sure that I would hang my hat on the mm. fact simply for that reason. Mm -hmm. but, but what it will mean, I, I presume, is that uh, if, if, the, if, the, if the, 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 uh, the balance of power is now shifting mm -hmm. to the right in, in, in Europe and migration is going to become a much hotter issue than it has been in the past, notwithstanding the fact that the pact has gone through, then it, it, is, it is not outside of the wit of the, of the new politicians coming in to, 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 to introduce further legislation in the EU, which could potentially have an impact on this, this problem. Because Absolutely. we're very vulnerable here, as you can clearly see. I think maybe that's what you're alluding to, that, uh, that Ireland could be forced to take even a greater quantity than 600 a week in order to um, a, a facilitate uh, other countries that have decided um, to, to buy their way out. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. Um, yeah. Mm. So um, all told then, uh, Tracy, because you know, you've, you've been through the wars. Uh, I've watched you from cl close up and from a distance over the last few years, and you've, you've put in a mighty stint. Um, and I know you're across an awful lot of these issues. So how do you, wh where's your sense of, 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 of what, what you see uh, for Ireland uh, towards the end of this decade? I mean, how do you, how do you see all this playing out? Um, I past, past the general election, I mean, just where, where are we going here? Um, I think it all depends what happens with this general election. I think it all depends on who the people vote into power. Um, I think if you even look at the likes of the Green Party and the likes of Pauline O'Reilly, who stood in the, the Shannon Chamber maybe 12 months ago and said that the, the role of government, the role of TDs, is to restrict freedom. So I think if we're continued to elect TDs and senators into positions of power who believe that their sole responsibility is to restrict the freedom of the people that they're elected to govern, we're going nowhere. Mm. So unless we actually elect people into the Dáil and into the Shannad, uh, obviously I know people in the Shannad are selected rather than elected, uh, but unless we elect TDs who believe in freedom, who believe in true freedom, we're going nowhere and we're going towards potentially Agenda 2030, which is you know, an agenda to have as much control as possible over as much of the as much of the world as yeah, possible. So this is the 21st century totalitarianism yes. that's, uh, that's been long planned. Yes. Mm. Well, we'll see how it plays out mm -hmm. because um, I'm going to leave it there uh, with Tracy. We'll see how it all plays out because uh, the world seems to be going into maybe a bipolar or tripolar blocks in, in, in the years to come, which you can see formulating around China, Washington, and um, um, don't be surprised if we end up in a, in a, with, with, an, with an option to move into a Eurasian uh, economic bloc uh, over the years ahead. Um, it's certainly fascinating, it's deeply worrying. Uh, I was bitterly disappointed uh, myself uh, with the performance uh, of the WIP system um, in this momentous decision which was taken uh, during the week. And I was particularly disappointed, but not surprised, that there hasn't been an inch of coverage about it uh, in, in, your, in, in the media that you go out and buy, your Irish Independent, your Irish Examiner, uh, and, uh, and of course the Irish Times, and RT, and News Talk, and the rest of them. Uh, it, it really is bitterly disappointing uh, that, the, that the voice of the people, which was clearly evident from the 18 independent TDs that voted, clearly evident on the ground if you were going around as well, has been ignored. Uh, I think there's going to be a price to pay for that at the next general election. At least I hope so. Thank you very much for listening and thank you so much, Tracy, Thanks, Eddie, uh, for, for explaining th that in, in great detail and, uh, and, and, v and v very interesting insights into where we are. And I, ho I certainly hope that it has cleared up uh, a lot of the confusion around where we are now and where we could go next. Thank you very much for listening.